Hello, I'm Ben Spurgeon from the ISCVE. I'd like to welcome you to this bite-sized training course on the director reverberant ratio, written by Tony Stacey. In this module, we're going to be talking about what the director reverberant ratio is and why it's so important for speech intelligibility. So, what is the director reverberant ratio? Here, we have a two-dimensional representation of a room with the sound source, labelled S, and a receiver, R. The receiver might be a listener or maybe even a measurement microphone. The sound arriving at the receiver consists of two parts. First, we have the direct sound, which travels directly from the source to the receiver, and secondly, the reflected sound. The reflected sound is anything that has one or more reflections. But not all reflected sounds are the same. If the sound reflects off of a single surface, it is known as a first order reflection. If the sound source reflects off of two surfaces, that's a second order reflection, and so on and so on. The sound which travels directly from the source to the receiver is said to have a zero order reflection. So, let's consider a gunshot. Here at A0 and a receiver at 0, 01. The scale on the right hand side gives the order of the reflections, where red means the sound hasn't undergone any reflections, and green means the sound has undergone one reflection, and so on. So, let's fire the gun. OK, the sound has just reached the receiver, and because it's red, it hasn't undergone any reflections, so this is called the direct sound. Of course, before the sound reaches the receiver, reflections are already happening in the room. As you can see, there are already first, second and some yellow third order reflections, but those haven't reached the receiver yet. So let's continue the simulation. Soon, there are many hundreds and in real life many thousands of reflections reaching the receiver, some having reflected off many surfaces many times beforehand. Because the air and surfaces are absorbing, the sound gradually dies away. It's worth noting that the direct sound is not only the first to arrive, it's also usually louder than any of the reflections. An exception to this might be when the sound source emits sound much louder in a direction away from the receiver, in which case it's possible that a reflected sound could be louder than the direct. However, the reverberant level is the sum of all the reflections, and so you can be very much louder than the direct level. So in summary, what is the direct to reverberant ratio? It's simply the difference between the direct sound pressure level and the sound pressure level of the sum of all of the reflections, i.e. the reverberant level. Let's have a listen to how the direct to reverberant ratio can affect the intelligibility of speech. Here we have a large reverberant hall with a mid-frequency reverberation time of 7.5 seconds, so very, very reverberant. In this hall we have a sound source in blue and a listener that is sat 50 metres away. Let's listen to a message at this location. As you can hear, that isn't very easily understood. Let's move the listener so now they are one metre away from the speaker and see how that sounds. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. Much more easily understood, isn't it? So what just happened? The acoustics of the hall didn't change, the sound source didn't change, and the listener didn't change. It just got closer to the source. The frequency response may have changed a little bit, but the most important thing that's changed, from an intelligibility point of view, is the direct to reverberant ratio. So, what's going on? This graph shows the relationship between the direct level, the reverberant level and the total level as a listener moves away from a source in a room. On the y-axis is the sound pressure level measured in decibels and the x-axis shows the distance from the sound source in metres. The blue line represents the direct level. For a loudspeaker that is considered to be a point source, the sound pressure level falls off at approximately 6 dB per doubling of distance. This is known as the inverse square law. The yellow line represents the reverberant level. This is the result of the sound reflecting off of the surfaces. As you can see, the reverberant level is consistent, no matter what the distance is from the sound source. This is true when the reverberant field is what is called diffuse. A good definition of a diffuse field is one that is isotrophic and homogeneous. 
That means it's the same everywhere and isn't travelling in any particular direction. A reasonable assumption in very reverberant rooms. The critical distance is when the direct level is equal to the reverberant level. Before the critical distance, the direct level is higher than the reverberant level, and so the direct to reverberant ratio is positive. Beyond the critical distance, the direct level falls below the reverberant level, and the direct to reverberant ratio becomes more and more negative. The black line represents the total level. It's the logarithmic sum of the direct and reverberant levels. This is what you measure when you measure with a sound level meter. It's not possible to measure just the direct or just the reverberant level unless one of them is insignificant, such as in an anechoic chamber. In an anechoic chamber, which absorbs all of the reflections, the reverberant level is insignificant. The opposite of this is a reverberation chamber, where the direct level is insignificant. This graph shows why, even in a very reverberant space like a cathedral for example, we can easily talk to and be understood by someone that is stood next to us or close by. So far, we've been talking about a single sound source and a single receiver, but what about when you have multiple sound sources and more than one receiver in a room? Here, we have a typical atrium area with two balcony levels. To give you a sense of scale, the width of the atrium is approximately 40 metres. Let's put two receivers in the space at 0, 01 and 0, 02, and then one loudspeaker which is at A1, located close to receiver 0, 01. If we run the simulation, we get for this space an SPL that is a sound pressure level of 69 dBA and 0.57 STI at the receiver 0, 01. With that, we also get 66 dBA and 0.41 STI at receiver 0, 02. For those of you that haven't heard of an STI measurement, it stands for Speech Transmission Index, and it's a measure of how intelligible a transmission path is. A measurement of STI returns a number anywhere between 0 and 1, where 0 is no intelligibility and 1 is perfect intelligibility. For sound systems for emergency purposes, we usually aim for an STI of no less than 0 0.5 anywhere within the venue. As you can see, the STI at receiver 0 1 is fine, but at receiver 0 2 we're falling below what is ideal at 0 0.41. From what we learnt earlier, this result is perhaps not surprising. We clearly need a loudspeaker closer to receiver 0 2. In fact, since it's the whole area we're trying to cover, we're going to need multiple loudspeakers to cover all possible receiver locations. So let's add more loudspeakers. So now, receiver 0 2 is also being covered along with everywhere in between. The SPL for both receivers has now increased to around 76 dBA. Note that I'm not reducing the level to each loudspeaker. That's why the SPL is increasing. The STI at receiver 0 2 has, as expected, increased. In fact, it now passes the 0.5 minimum STI measurement. However, the STI at receiver 0 1 has gone down from 0 0.57 to 0 0.5. It still passes though, so all is well. But hold on. What about the balcony areas? We now have balcony loudspeakers, including under the ground floor balcony. As expected, the SPL has gone up due to having more loudspeakers, but as you can see, the STI at receiver 01 and 02 now fail the sound system for emergency purposes target of 0.5. So what's happened? Here is an analogy I like to use to help explain it. The bath water analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think it goes a long way. Consider this two-dimensional bath with water in it. The water in the bath represents the potential for reverberant energy. Of course, a reverberant level can't actually exist until a sound source is added, but go with me here. The bottom of the bath is the area that we want to cover. Each black block represents a loudspeaker, where the height of the block represents the direct level the loudspeaker produces. The width of the block represents the area the loudspeaker covers, and the level of the water within the bath represents the reverberant level. So let's add a block, a loudspeaker. The top of the block is above the water, and so we have a positive direct to reverberant ratio, but we've only covered a quarter of the area. So let's add another loudspeaker. The water level, i.e. the reverberant level, increases, but we still have a positive direct to reverberant ratio. The top of the blocks are still above the water, but we need to add more blocks to cover the whole area at the bottom of the bath. 
As we add more loudspeakers, the water level becomes higher than the top of the blocks, and the direct reverberant ratio becomes more and more negative. So here's the problem. By adding more loudspeakers in order to cover an area rather than a single receiver, we make the direct reverberant ratio and hence the speech intelligibility worse. It's the way it works, unfortunately. There are ways and means to improve the situation, but I'll leave that for another day. That's the end of this bite-sized training on the direct to reverberant ratio. Thank you for listening and I hope you found it interesting. If you want to know more or to be able to ask questions, please sign up for one of the many ISCVE training courses by going to the website and then head to the training page. Thank you for listening.